a mission to discover new planets potentially capable of sustaining life was announced today. The proposed telescope project will look for planets in the Goldilocks zone around the star system just four light years away. Joining us live now is Professor Peter Tuthill, an astrophysical imaging expert at the University of Sydney. Peter, appreciate your time. I mentioned that you're focusing on an area known as the Goldilocks zone. For those of us not up to date with uh, space geographies, tell us a bit about that zone. Why is it called that? Where is it? What's so special about it? Well, we're sort of looking for life as we know it. And of course, life not as we know it would be another interesting question to address. But we've only got one data point. We've only got, you know, the rock we live on here, the Earth. That's the only biosphere we know of, the only place, little island in the universe where we know there's life. Maybe there could be life in the solar system, maybe Mars, Venus, but we know it's here. That's the only place we've got. So when we go to look out in the cosmos, uh, our first instinct as scientists is to try and look for the most analogous, the most similar conditions that we find here. So the Goldilocks zone is part of that equation. You know, you want a, a rock a bit like the Earth, that orbits at just the right distance from its host star so that it's got a temperate climate. Liquid water on the surface is one of the gold standards we use to define this Goldilocks zone, the just right orbit. Okay, so not too hot, not too cold, essentially, is where the Goldilocks reference comes from, I assume. You're talking about finding a planet capable of supporting life, I, I, I guess that's really the dream. Apart from the temperature, what else does a planet need to fit that bill? We're not necessarily talking about supporting human life here, are we? Uh, not exactly, although, you know, in a distant future, maybe some of these habitable zone planets that have rocky surfaces like Earth could potentially be visited by humans, and that's another super exciting prospect off into the, you know, off into the visionary future. Um, but, I mean, yes, in some sense, the kind of life as we know it, that we're looking for in this instance, is kind of biological life as we would find it here. And uh, yeah, so we're looking for those conditions to be as similar as possible to, to those we find on Earth. So tell us a bit about the telescope. How does it work? What is so special about this technology that you're hoping will lead to a breakthrough? Well, astronomers, you may, maybe if you've been paying attention to the astronomy news, you'll find Announcements of new planets are, are fairly common these days. You know, we, we keep seeing them in the news every other week. There's another planet being found. This kind of masks a little bit of a, a dark secret in astronomy, and that is that we're actually not very good at finding planets. Um, we are able to play the odds a little bit and find planets where we get a little bit lucky. So if we have enough stars and we go survey a whole bunch of them, then it turns out that some of these techniques, we're bound to get lucky if you just survey a million stars, you're going to find some planets, even if it takes this rare piece of luck to find one. But that equation doesn't work when you want to find a planet around the very nearest star to the Earth. So if you're asking a question about Alpha Centauri, and that's a really special star to me, I love Alpha Centauri, it's the closest star system to Earth. If you want to find a planet there, you can't rely on luck. You need a, an actual survey mission that can exhaustively answer the question, is there a planet there or not? Uh, and that's the special secret source we're, we, we're trying to develop with this Toleman mission. Um, it's able to detect any planet that's in, in those habitable zone orbits, right down to planets as low mass as the Earth. It'd be easy to find big gas giants like Jupiter, but uh, yeah, we want the rocky ones where we hope that there's a, a solid surface where life could have evolved the way we know it. Peter, clearly you've considered more than most this big question of whether life can be sustained outside of Earth. What is your expert view? You talked about this perhaps coming a reality one day down the track. How far off do you think we're talking? Um, well, I mean, you, there's a number of questions you just wrapped up there. One of the questions is whether <laughs> there's life out there in the cosmos. Um, and I, I'm a kind of a firm believer there must be. It's, it's such a vast place. Uh, you know, the... The, the galaxy, as I study it, in 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 stars, the vast, unthinkably large numbers of stars. And each star could have a number of planets. So if you want to play the odds on that one, and I just said before I'm not the guy to play the odds, but if you do want to play the odds, then the chances that some of those must host life, I think, are overwhelming. Um, on the other hand, you know, things get more and more difficult if you ask about how advanced that life might be, whether there could be intelligent life. 
And the scales of distance we're talking about, and astronomers are used to understanding these scales, but in everyday life, you might say, well, the nearest star is four light years away. It doesn't sound very far. But at the speeds of our fastest modern space probes, that's like a 100,000 year journey. It's a very, very long way. That's the nearest one. So, uh, you know, there are, there are pros and cons here. You know, I, th I think the universe is a fascinating place and the, the likelihood there are interesting things out there is very, very high. But our ability to get to those places will really require these vast leaps in technology before we can span those interstellar voids and, you know, one day to dream of, of becoming a galactic species, getting out into the galaxy. And Peter, for that leap to happen, I mean, it, it sounds expensive, right? I, I saw that uh, part of the, the grant that, that you're working with has been provided by a philanthropist. Where are we at in terms of who's really pushing this sort of next level space exploration now? We heard so much recently about billionaires sending rockets into space. Is private enterprise uh, taking over from governments now in, in the space area? Is that, is that your view? To some degree, that, that is happening. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, SpaceX and some of those kind of uh, launch providers are now building really visionary technologies uh, that are, you know, things that they're doing, things NASA can't do in some sense. So they, you know, got really heavy launch capabilities. So, yeah, the, there is what's called disruptive, um, you know, disruptive Silicon Valley thinking going on, and it is changing the space industry. And I think that's to the good. That's all, um, that's, that's pushing everything. And actually, it's in turn coming back to the space agencies that they've got to pick up their game to compete now. Um, and yes, there is becoming uh, more cognizance that investment in these kind of areas is something that, is now within the reach of private individuals. So um, my mission has, uh, the Breakthrough Price Foundation has invested in the technologies we're building, uh, along with you know, the University of Sydney and uh, some of our other partners at NASA. So yeah, we're very much in partnership with these people. And I think the whole idea that we're pursuing with my mission in particular, this focus on the nearby stars, that is really something that's come th from this Breakthrough Foundation. So, as an astronomer, you know I'm pretty happy. Most astronomers are pretty happy with finding any planet. You know, a planet that's ten times further away. Well, sure, maybe it's a little harder to study, but it's not that much different from a planet that's right next door. On the other hand, if you're not an astronomer, if you're not really interested in that discipline of academic science, if you're if you're an engineer and you want to fly there, there's a vast difference between a four light year journey and a forty light year journey. So from the perspective of those visionary leaps we hope to achieve in the future, maybe we can send a probe one day. Maybe even my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren can fly there in some kind of futuristic spaceship. Then the AlphaSend system, the one I'm studying, really comes into clear focus because that system is going to be our first bus stop out there on our way to the rest of the galaxy. Peter Tuttle, it is fascinating stuff and we look forward to hopefully having you back on again soon to tell us about any developments that you come across. We'd love to hear about it. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks very much.